Vrakas made us from stone to protect Gurdlgar. from the workshop. Ah! I'd be happy to pass on this present to the Greenskins. Gizelbert I and I, the father of the Fifthling clan, has not been on the front line of battle against the creatures of Teon for many cycles. The king surveys the battlefield and the defenders with a grave expression. We are too few. This you know as well as he does. But there will be no reinforcements arriving. Hundreds of brave warriors lie inside the fortress dying. The illness is running rampant. It brings weakness and death. Stay at your posts. Be as steadfast as the granite of which we are made. Nothing can break us. Vrakas is with us. Yes? What is it? 
Losses beating them back. Come here and I'll split you like a straw, you treacherous elf! In his fury, the old king radiates a ferocious power that none of Sitalia's children could withstand. But the slight, willowy being sitting astride the shadow mare just grins down, mockingly. You are mistaken. We are Alpha. We are here to destroy the Elves. All peace-loving beings here in Girdlegard are under our protection, and you cannot open the gate that has barred your path into Girdlegard since the creation of the world. Not us, but perhaps one of your kind. This cannot be. Silence, you fool! Vrakas! Forgive me for what I am about to do! Quickly! In formation! You must hold them back until I close the gate! <laughs> Yeah. 
being off with you. Look at me. I am Syntharas, the Reaper of your death. I will take your life, and the land will take your soul. Get out of my sight, pointy ears, and let me delight at the closed gate a little longer. The gate may have closed, but when you rise again from the dead by the power of the land, you will be one of us, and you will open it. Never! My soul belongs to Rakas. No. Your soul now belongs to the land. And henceforth you will belong to it forever. Now die. And return. Then hand us Girdleguard. No! You're a perfectionist, Tungdale Bolifar. I've got a reputation to uphold. If you can't rely on the metalwork of a dwarf, what can you rely on? You look dreadful. What a charmer. The maid gives you an ironic, reprimanding scowl. Ikana has been crying half the night. When you were teething, I carried you around the vaults. You played with my beard and I sang you to sleep. Prala smiles. She's heard this story many times before. That was 23 cycles ago. But I'm quite sure you didn't sing. You might have grumbled a bit. If what you've read about the Dwarven lifespan is true, it'll be another 300 sun cycles and more before you are called to the Eternal Forge. The certainty of one day having to witness Frala's death already burdens your heart. What can I do for you? For me, nothing. It's Lot Yonan. He wants to see you in his study. In your mind, you go through all the recent incidents that might have annoyed the Magus. Apart from a few little squabbles with his famuli, nothing worth mentioning happened since the incident with your beard. You nod. Okay. I'd better not keep the Magus waiting. See you later. There's goulash for dinner. There was a time when you could hardly lift the heavy hammer. Now you barely notice it anymore and it... Hey! Groundling! Come to the kitchen, we need you! Jollison, a fourth degree famulus and your favorite foe among the students of magic, gives you a disparaging glance and disappears without waiting for your reply. 
Dill! Quick! Or the goulash will get burnt! You immediately recognise what the problem is. A chain running over a pulley for positioning the cauldron is detached from its mounting and the cauldron stuck in the fireplace. It's a heavy load and none of the famuli, who feel superior even during kitchen duty, dare do anything. They might burn their fingers or even get a bit dirty. It'd be a waste of goulash. And I'm hungry. Here, hold this. You damned freak! For a moment, you hope the Famulus really does raise his hand to you. But then he comes to his senses and leaves the kitchen, his face bright red. What a pair you are! The goulash is bubbling in the cauldron. You draw the warm air in through your nose, and the smell makes your mouth start watering. The goulash is... Vegetables, bread, cheese, but the cook is not to be trifled with. Many painful knuckles have taught you that she knows how to handle her heavy wooden spoon, and that she may possibly have eyes in the back of her head. Do you know what Lord Yonan wants? The maid gives you an amused look. She has often accused you of making things more complicated than necessary. The beer that is delivered to the vaults is supposed to be the best beer in Iddersleyn. It's certainly your favourite beer. But you haven't drunk enough other beers to truly know. I should speak to Lord Yonan first. He doesn't like to be kept waiting. You mumble and wonder when you started speaking thoughts like this out loud? Blacksmith, do you want something? Did a horse bolt while you were trying to shoe it? It's certainly not on our plates. Of the 200 or so people selected to learn the art of magic under Lot Yonan, there's barely a handful of them you can stand the sight of. You're not at all interested in magic in all its elusiveness and whimsy. Your realm is the Forge. Master Lot Yonan, Frala told me you wished to speak with me. Ah, Tungdil, come in. Uh, there is a bag over there in the cupboard. Take it out, please. It contains artifacts belonging to my former Famulus Goren. I wish to return them to him. He's in Black Saddle, 300 miles away. 300 miles? That's a long journey. Who are you going to entrust with this? I was thinking of you. Me? There is no one better to take on this journey. You have acquired much knowledge. You are almost a scholar. 
You know more than most family about Girdle Guard and its inhabitants. It is time for you to go out into the world and see it with your own eyes. I... with pleasure. Perhaps I'll meet some dwarves on my travels. Yes, perhaps. But don't hold out too much hope. And be careful who you talk to. Not everyone out there likes dwarves. Yeah, goblins. They abduct baby dwarves and sell them to magi, from what I've heard. Not the best bit of business I've ever done. But what was I to do? The long noses threatened to throw you into the nearest river. What's in the bag? Magical devices. Uh, you better leave the bag closed if you want to avoid any accidents. Dwarves don't really like magic, and magic doesn't like you either. Rackus gave us so much craftsmanship that there's no space left in our bodies for magic. Strictly speaking, every time you've been too close to magic, it has ended in catastrophe. Be on your guard. Look after the bag and don't lose it. May Palandiel be with you. And Varakas too, of course. I'll set off immediately. I'll see you soon, Lot Yeoman. You're about to dive headlong into your adventure, but then stop yourself. A journey over 300 miles without provisions and a weapon. Shouldn't forget to think in all my excitement. I wonder if dwarves ask Rackus for help on long journeys. The figure on the homemade altar doesn't answer. This is where you swung the forge hammer for the first time 30 cycles ago. No one taught you the craft. It was enough for you to watch Lot Yonan's old smith at work. Whenever the workshop was empty, you practiced and quickly mastered the craft with ease. There are apparently dwarves who have never seen the sky. And you too feel more comfortable when you have rock over your head. If only you didn't long to see more of the world, a longing that grows stronger with every year. Hello, Frala. Hmm? I've got a present for you. You take out a symbol of protection that you've carefully made from three horseshoe nails. It's not the finest jewellery in Girdleguard. 
One look at Frala's face makes it clear that it doesn't matter. She glows with happiness as she takes the pendant. For me? But why? Because you don't see me as an oddity, and you're like a little sister to me. You could have said. But you settle with a shrug and a crooked smile. I need provisions for 300 miles. You're grinning from ear to ear. Finally, you've got the chance to see something of the world. 300? Tungdal, that's no errand. That's an epic journey. Wait, I've got just the right thing. But make sure the cook doesn't see. I'm going to Black Saddle to return a few things to a former apprentice in Amagus. You pocket the rye bread, sausages and ham. Enough food for the first few days of your journey. Perhaps I'll even meet some dwarves on the way. Frala throws you a cautious glance. It's a tricky subject that you can't help but broach. There aren't dwarves down here. You're the only one in Idda's Lane, as far as we know. I know, but I can't just have been born out of a rock. Somewhere in the mountains, I have a clan. Maybe even a family. Yes. Maybe. Frala has reminded you more than once that Lot Yonan wrote to the dwarf clans and none of them were missing a dwarf boy. I have to go. I've got a long journey ahead of me. I wish you the blessing of Palandiel and Vrakas to protect you from all danger in your journey. Here, a talisman. Whenever you look at it, think of me. Frala winks at you mischievously. And of getting me a nice present. How nice to see you again, Lot Yonan. It must have been an age since we last met face to face. Nudin, welcome. Please, sit down. No, thank you, my friend. These are urgent matters, and I don't have much time. You must come to Leos Nudin immediately. The perished land is stirring. Are you sure? What makes you think that? I found out about 60 orbits ago, during a visit to the borders. Our magical barriers have weakened and become porous. The Elfa have left their land, and a huge horde of orcs have marched into Girdelgard. Were you able to strengthen the spell with your magic? No. I can't repair the damage alone. We need the combined power of the six. The other four are already on their way here, but we need your help, too. I will set off for Perista without delay. Oh, and uh, as you're coming, could you also take the opportunity to bring back the things that I lent to you? Of course. I have them already packed in a bag. Oh, thank you. We'll be expecting you. Utterly blinded by the sunlight, you squeeze your eyes tightly shut after only a few steps. 
The time spent underground has made you so sensitive to light that you're forced to seek shelter in the shade of a mighty oak. You reach a small lake by a birchwood. Your feet hurt and your eyes still sting in the unaccustomed sunlight. But a smile spreads across your face nonetheless. You've covered a decent distance on the first day of your big journey. You pitch your camp and lie down to sleep on the hard forest floor. When you awake in the morning, your legs are stiff and achy. Trying not to feel sorry for yourself, you throw your rucksack over your shoulder. You're a dwarf and dwarves don't complain. Around midday, with the sun high in the sky and the first beads of sweat appearing on your forehead, you see something move next to the road, a few hundred meters ahead. Some crows are pecking at something in the long grass. The creaking leather armor, the clattering rucksack, and a dwarf's inability to be quiet makes the crows flap around as you move from one bush to another. You give up trying to be stealthy, stand up straight, and see two human bodies in the flattened grass. You don't see any signs of a struggle in the area where the corpses are lying. Were they stabbed by a companion? A stranger could hardly have crept up on them with such sparse cover. You scour the area once more and ask yourself what to do next. It's time-consuming and strenuous work digging shallow graves in the ground with a stick and covering the corpses with a few stones. But it should at least keep the crows from their feasting for a while. You continue on your way so as to put a few more miles between you and your grisly find before night falls. You see a flickering light through the trees some way from the path. It might come from a campfire. You walk towards the fire with confident strides until you finally make out three broad-shouldered men with axes. Two rabbits are sizzling over the fire. The men are joking with one another, but you can only understand the odd word. They haven't noticed you yet. You follow the path for about a mile and then set up camp. The next morning, you continue your journey. You reach the banks of the Warder and can see Axeldale on the other side. 
but there isn't a bridge for far and wide. The fishermen's boats glide over the water, which sparkles in the sun. None of the men seem to notice you while they throw out their nets. You leave the peaceful banks of the river behind you and continue on your way. You look down on a large village on the banks of the water. Some of the village is built on stilts in the river. A wooden bridge spans the fast-flowing water. A huge wooden palisade has been erected to protect the village from attack. Your eyes roam the land on the other side of the river. You estimate that you will soon have completed half of the journey to Black Saddle, but you still can't make out the mountain on the horizon. The guards on the palisade are watching you. Their armor looks well cared for and well made. The smith who made them knew what he was doing. You conclude that the men depend on the protection the armor offers and aren't just wearing them to look good. They are certainly not villagers. Some of the guards begin to whisper as you near the gate. Hello up there! What brings you to fair good water? And have you seen any orcs on your travels, groundling? The man leaning over the palisade eyes you up and down carefully. I'm a dwarf, I'll have you know, just like you are humans and not overgroundlings. So will you let me in now? I regret to inform you that we cannot allow you to enter. The gate stayed closed once night has fallen. There is certainly no regret showing in the man's face. The orc heads on the spears look fresh, a fact that causes you unease for more than one reason. Those won't scare orcs away. I hope not. The more orc heads that end up on those spears, the more gold coins that end up in our pockets. Right, boys? Yeah! That's right! Yeah! <laughs> We've killed our fair share of orcs and know how to motivate them. Those ugly mugs will spur them on, and then they'll perish in front of our gates. Two things become clear to you. Firstly, that the mercenaries the villagers have hired are excellent at killing orcs. And secondly, that they sadly have no brains at all. When did you kill these orcs? Yesterday. We caught a couple of their scouts first. The others tried to take revenge in the evening. Let's see who'll turn up today.
I've got 20 pieces of gold here looking for a taker in the village. Ha! Ah! One of your folk might leave his post for 20 pieces of gold, but I say clear off, Groundling. The gates stay closed until tomorrow morning. But... Oh. The double gate is made of strong planks. Sturdy, but still much less solid than the fixed parts of the palisade. Security has been forgone here for practical reasons. Never a good idea when building fortifications. As you get closer to part of the palisade, you hear whispering from the other side. Psst! Groundling! You look around and reach the palisade with a few quick steps. No one saw you. You see one of the mercenaries through the gaps in the palisade. He looks around nervously. Forty gold pieces, did you say? I offered your commander 20 gold pieces to open the gate. I can't open the gate for you, but I can let you in. There's a secret sally port just here. 30. 30 gold pieces. <sighs> Alright. 30 gold pieces and not a word to anyone. Phew, that would cost me my head too. You decide not to sneak around the village for too long and hide in some straw in a barn. You sleep uneasily, afraid you'll wake up at any moment with a knife at your throat. You don't feel very rested the next morning, but you manage to cross the bridge without incident and leave good water behind you. An uneasy feeling has been your constant companion since you left Goodwater. Every little sound in the forest makes you fear you've been discovered by a horde of orcs. But you reach the end of the day without bumping into any of the greenskins. It seems as though Vrakus has granted you one more day in Girdlegard. As night begins to fall, you pass a large oak tree and decide to call it a day. Near the oak tree, is an abandoned camp with a fireplace, which appears to be a couple of days old. You swing yourself up the trunk and then pull up your baggage after you. You're prepared to sleep in a tree like a bird if it means escaping the orc's attentions. You sling your rope twice around your stomach and the trunk of the tree to stop you from falling accidentally. You close your eyes and dream. You see North Pass and smell the fresh icy wind that sweeps over the peaks of Great Blade and Dragon's Tongue. But the harmony is interrupted by the hideous roar of an unending flood of orcs throwing itself unceasingly against the fortification. You smell the disgusting green blood of the orcs and taste the rancid fat of their armour on your tongue. The bitter taste becomes stronger until it's unbearable and wrenches you out of your dream. You open your eyes and are surprised at the brightness as a glance at the sky confirms that it's still night. Your eyes move towards the ground, and what you see makes the blood in your veins freeze.
am Synthras of Son Balsur. My master, Nod On the Doublefold, ruler of the Perished Land, has elected you, the lords of Taboribor, to be the sword that conquers the south. You mean, you want us to put our necks on the line and be killed by some magus? Lord Yonan and the others will be taken care of. Your task is to create a diversion in the south until my master's plan succeeds. And which of us is the leader? The one that conquers the most land. So Kragma will be the new Grand Lord. He glares at Ushnox and Bashkog. The Kragma Shore Tribe will conquer the most land. Never! We will overwhelm the cities of the Red Bloods quicker than you can set the marrow from a bone. We shall see. You can't believe what you're hearing. If the beasts of Teon ride into battle together, catastrophic cycles lie ahead for Girdlegard. The night in the oak tree was the worst of your life. You spent every single moment afraid that you would be found and savaged by the orcs. But as the first rays of sun broke through the treetops, the orcs abandoned their camp and left without discovering you. Better safe than sorry. Your eyes scan the deserted camp and you listen carefully for any noise. But you don't see or hear anything suspicious. Ugh. You're overcome by the urge to vomit. You have, of course, heard the stories but seeing with your own eyes that orcs actually do eat humans is a long way from just reading about it. This is the place. I knew it was here. Come on, then. Find that stupid necklace. Hey, Fushka! In front of you! <laughs> a grounding! Perfect for a spot of breakfast! You know that you're no warrior, but you want to face the orcs as a child of the Divine Smith. Perhaps you'll manage to kill at least one of them, so as not to appear so undwarven in Varakas' eyes. I'll give you something to chew on. Varakas made us of stone. And this time, hold it tight! Hey! That one was mine! You're just too slow, dear brother! Too slow? Just wait! Huh? 
Wait a moment! Yeah! 